Okay, on to the thorny problem of measurement in quantum mechanics. It's even called the measurement problem um, because we still haven't got to the bottom of it. That doesn't mean that there isn't a lot about measurement in quantum mechanics that we do understand. And obviously that's what I'm going to tell you about over the course of the next few videos. But just I'll hammer that home. If you're thinking, well, but why does it do that? The answer in some cases is we just don't know yet. Maybe you can come along and um, tell us in a few years time just what we were missing all, all along. Um, but as I say, what I, what I dislike a little bit is, is, well, quantum is weird, nothing's understandable, we just have to get, get on with it. There is an aspect of that, but there's a logical framework there, there's a mathematical framework that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yes, we don't fully understand everything, but that doesn't mean we don't understand anything. So, thus far we've looked at quantum systems, a few different quantum systems. We've looked at the wave function and we've looked more recently at how the wave function varies in time as well as varying in space, particularly with regard to Gaussian wave packets. What we haven't done is consider, well, now we're going to make a measurement. Now we're going to make a measurement of, say, energy or position or momentum. What does that do to the quantum system? And what it does is very, very different from what happens in a classical system, whereby in a classical case, we prefer to think of our measurements as non-invasive in that they don't radically alter the system. It's like we're going in, we're trying to measure temperature, we're putting a, you know, a, a thermometer in there or some type of temperature measuring device. What we hope is that we're, by putting that um, thermometer in there, we're not actually d dramatically distorting the behavior of the system. In quantum mechanics, we dramatically distort the behavior of the system. Often, not always, but often we do by applying uh, a measurement. So that's a very big difference from classical systems. Another very big difference from classical systems, and we've touched on this before, is that, of course, the wave function, the quantum state, is not an observable. Whereas in a classical system, the state is an observable in terms of position and momentum. So it's not an observable in quantum mechanics, largely because it's a complex valued function. We get the modulus squared, that gives us a probability density. Moreover, if we measure in a classical system, you know, position and momentum, one after the other, back and forth, it doesn't matter in which order we make those measurements. In quantum mechanics, it very much does. Again, not always, but in many cases it does. The order of measurement makes a big difference. What else have we got? In classical systems, energy is a continuous um, you know, function. So if we've got a pendulum knocking back and forth, we think about its potential energy, that's a continuous curve. In quantum mechanics, and you've already seen this in terms of the particle in a box and what you did in terms of the harmonic oscillator last year, energy is quantized. Again, not in, all quant not in all systems, in all quantum systems, but in systems where we've got confinement, the energy is quantized. What do I mean by confinement? I mean the particle, the quantum system, is constrained to a region of space. And finally, for now, a key difference between classical and quantum systems is, of course, the probabilistic nature of quantum systems. We talk about making a measurement um, of position or momentum, say, but we, can we can't talk about getting a fixed value for position or momentum. We get a range of different values. We can talk about a mean or an expectation value, but with the classical system we can say, well, the position is this. With a quantum system, well, we can say that the position falls within this range, within a certain delta x, momentum falls within a certain delta p. That's a big difference as well, of course. So, let's, having brought out that distinction again between classical and quantum systems, let's move on to think about the mathematical framework underpinning uh, quantum systems in terms of measurement. The best way to do this, I think, is we're going to have our second postulate, TQW postulate 2. Let me put that up on the screen, and I'll just read it. To every physically measurable quantity O, called an observable or dynamical variable, 
there corresponds a linear Hermitian operator O hat whose eigenfunctions form a complete basis. Okay, so I'm not expecting you to, to understand really very much of that right now. What we're going to do over the course of the next few videos is tease out almost word for word what that postulate actually means. Let's start with operators. You've used operators already. You've used a quite sophisticated uh, operator, which is nothing more than a mathematical operation in terms of the Fourier transform when we've converted from position to momentum or vice versa. Another um, operator is the differentiation operator. And let's write it like that. Now this one you're very, very familiar with in that in one dimension, it's just that. We put this little hat on to distinguish an operator from a variable. So big D with a hat, differentiation operator. Now you could call it other things. But, or you could obviously use different labels for it. But we'll call it big D. So, Let's say we've got d operating on a function f of x. Let's say our function is something we've seen before, say e to the i k 0 x. That implies that if d is operating on f of x, that's going to be equal to nothing more than just the derivative. Let me move that over. Just the derivative of this function, which is i k 0 e to the i k 0 x. So that's nothing new. We've seen it before. It's just the idea of operator operating on function. You've got a mathematical operation that um, gives back another function. That's all an operator is. We're going to be seeing operators for position, momentum, and energy. That's a pretty straightforward example. Let's now make it a little bit more quantum mechanical. We're not, again, I'm not introducing anything new here in that you've seen this expression before, or this equation before many times. Hamiltonian operator operates on an eigenfunction to return that eigenfunction, that self-same eigenfunction, multiplied by an eigenvalue. This is what is called an eigenvalue problem. And eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are at the very core of quantum mechanics, as we're going to see. You will often, even on a site that I love, which is called hyperphysics, I've mentioned this a few times before, but I'll, I'll keep mentioning it, because it's... Uh, there are a range of different papers, educational studies that have found that in terms of conceptual difficulties with regard to quantum mechanics for not just undergraduates but postgraduates, this is one of the key ones. Often this equation is written like this. So it's an eigenvalue equation, but what it says is that the Hamiltonian operating on the state psi is equal to E times psi. That is an expression for the time-independent Schrodinger equation that is seen many times. I really dislike this expression. This is better. This is even better. But even then, it's still confusing because psi is usually meant to re is usually used to represent the overall quantum state. And so, if we write it like this. That is implying that we take a Hamiltonian operator, or energy operator, and apply it to a quantum state, we got back energy times the original quantum state. That is only true for eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, which are those, when it comes to the particle in a box, which are those resonances standing waves, solutions of the time-independent Schrodinger equation, those are your eigenfunctions. It's not that you can take an arbitrary um, quantum state, which can be a mixture of these eigenfunctions, and get back exactly the same um, quantum state. Again, if that doesn't make sense, keep, stay with it. We're going to tease that out in a great deal more detail, not just in terms of chalk and talk, but also in terms of some simulations. What is H here? Hamiltonian, and it's got two terms. Minus H bar squared over 2m, if we're talking about one dimension, 
That, that's our kinetic energy term, plus V. Or, can, traditionally we call the kinetic energy operator T. So this would be T plus V. And so this is our mathematical operation to pull out the kinetic energy. Our mathematical operation for the potential energy term is very straightforward. We'll just take the product of this with our um, state, oh, sorry, with our eigenfunction. So, we've got that operating on that, gives us that eigenvalue. Similarly, eigenfunction here. I'm going to be coming in back in the next video, perhaps the one after that, really to this expression in the context of the particle in a box. So, Hamiltonian operator, kinetic energy operator, and potential energy operator we've covered. We also have the momentum operator. In one dimension, we'll stick with one dimension. All this, of course, ports across to two and more dimensions. You'll get onto two and more dimensions. We'll touch on them a little bit later on this semester, but mostly you'll cover two and more dimensions when you get to second semester and Walter will be covering that. Um, that's our momentum operator. Make sure, and it's one of the questions in the notes, make sure you can see how the momentum operator and the kinetic energy operator are related. I had a question on this last year, I got a number of emails, I was delighted to get a number of emails. Well, um, okay, but where does the minus come from? Think about that. Think about just how K is divine, for example. But um, make sure you can see the relationship between this and this. And if you can't, drop me an email and I'll talk you through it. It's one of the questions in the notes, however, so try it, um, try, try doing it yourself. That's our momentum operator. Now, there's a difference here in terms of when we have our eigenfunctions for a Hamiltonian operator in the case where we've got confinement, so the particles are in a box. The particle is in a box. You're going to get sick of seeing this, but we've got u1, u2, etc, etc, etc. Infinity out here and zero within the box. Here what we have is well-defined um, discrete states. So we only have certain values of energy, which as you know for the um, particle in a box, for the infinite potential well, where L is the width of the well. Discrete. And why do we have these particular quantized value? It's fundamentally related to the confinement and the fact that we have boundary conditions that mean that our wave function must go to zero. That's fundamentally where our quantization is coming about. And these are our energy eigenvalues. So in that case, our energy eigenvalue expression gives us discrete values of, of energy. However, if we have, for example, a momentum operator and we apply a momentum operator to then what we get back is, remember, minus i h bar, what we're going to get here, i k e to the i k x, which is going to be um, I by I gives us minus 1, take the minus 1, so what we get, um, for a minus the minus, negative the minus 1, we're going to get a positive, so we get h bar k e to the i k x. Notice the difference here, in that here we've got constraints. Here we have a plane wave solution which doesn't have constraints. It's a plane wave that extends across all um, space, in this case, we're just considering the spatial um, term, spatial aspect of it. And in this case, our eigenvalue expression, operator operating on eigenfunction, gives us back our eigenfunction times our 
eigenvalue. But there are no constraints on this. That value of k can be anything. Fundamentally, our quantization comes from confinement. In terms of the quantization of energy, it's due to the confinement. For this particular eigenvalue expression, this operator operating on this eigenfunction, we don't have confinement. We can take any value of k and this will work for that. Perhaps a subtle point, but this difference between discrete and continuous is key and we'll come back to it very soon. So let's do a slightly more, slightly trickier, um, but not that much trickier, I hope you find, um, example of operator algebra. So this is taken directly out of the notes, worked example on page um, 60 of the notes. So that ux equal to e to minus x squared over 2 is an eigenfunction of the operator O hat where that operator is d squared dx squared minus x squared. So that's our operator. So we're asked to show that that is an eigenfunction of this. So first of all, well, ultimately we want the second derivative, so let's get the first derivative. So d dx of e to the minus x squared over 2 is equal to, well, minus x minus x e to the minus x squared over 2. Agreed? I hope. Says he talking to a camera that can't talk back. Um, now, here is where I see a mistake, and quite a few of my colleagues teaching second year um, modules also see this. We've now got to get the second derivative. Remember that when we're getting the second derivative, what we have is a product here of two functions. So we have to use the product rule. So, second derivative of this is going to be, well, I remember this. You might remember it in other ways. I remember the first times derivative of a second plus second times derivative of a first. So that would be minus x, same thing again, minus x e to the minus x squared over 2 plus the second e to the minus x squared over 2 by the derivative of the first gives us a minus 1. Okay. That in turn implies that d squared dx squared of our function, uh, let's just write it like that, ux is equal to uh, x squared e to the minus x squared over 2 minus uh, e to the minus x squared over 2. But our operator was actually d squared dx squared minus x squared. So that implies, in turn, that implies that our operator operating on u gives us d squared dx squared of u, which is x squared, um, let's write it as u, that function is u, minus u, x squared by u minus u minus, now we've got this, which is also operating on u, gives us minus x squared u, where u is our original function here. So that means, in turn, that our operator operating in u gives us, the, well, that minus that, there you go, gives us minus u. So, indeed, u is an eigenfunction of the operator O, hat, and the eigenvalue is minus 1. So eigenvalue problems involve a little bit of maths, but it's no more mathematically sophisticated, I would say, than, than anything you've done. In fact, I would say that's no more mathematically sophisticated than very many things you've done at A-level. So again, quantum mechanics is dressed up as this, oh, it's incredibly mathematically difficult and it's incredibly conceptually difficult. It certainly can be conceptually difficult, but again, I will stress that there's an underlying mathematical framework that is really, really elegant and is actually really logical. And in terms of measurements, what we say is we make a measurement with a particular 
operator that what we return or what that measurement gives us is an eigenfunction of that particular operator with a certain probability for that particular eigenfunction um, and we'll get to just what that probability is which and probabilities in terms of quantum versus classical probabilities and the parallels between the two is the subject of the next video. See you then.